Hi there, wherever you happen to be. Welcome once again to Unstoppable Mindset, where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. Unexpected is always fun, but we also talk about inclusion first because it's the only way to make sure that we deal with everyone. The problem with diversity is it has tended to leave out disabilities. Some may disagree, but when you hear people discuss diversity, they don't discuss disabilities. Whether we discuss disabilities today or not is another story, but we will definitely be hitting the unexpected. Our guest today is Evan Robert Brown Walker. We're going to call him Evan because he said I could. And Evan is an interesting individual. Evan feels that he's on a mission to empower others, especially in unrep or underrepresented communities, and he wants to help them thrive, which is as good as it gets. So that gets us to the unexpected because it deals with all sorts of stuff. But Evan, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. We're really glad you're here. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm so happy to be here and really looking forward to the discussion. Let's go ahead and start by talking a little bit about maybe you growing up and all that, where you came from, and sort of all those things that helped shape you where you are. Well, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I was raised by a single mother who has been there with me every step of the way. And I, of course, I'm, I'm an only child, so I had a, a little miniature schnauzer growing up who I considered my brother. I have friends and, you know, close people as well, but my mom and my miniature schnauzer sparkle are miniature schnauzer were really my immediate family. And then my dad, I got to know sort of towards the tail end of my high school career. That's when I really got to know, started to get to know him. He's based in High Point, North Carolina. I ended up making a decision to go to High Point University. And so he and I became closer, developed the relationship that still lasts today. So that's a little bit about my background. So that's pretty cool. So you made the decision to reach out to him, which is something that has to be a little bit of a brave step by any standard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any standard reaching out to a parent you don't know or may not know as well as you think you do, reaching out to them is, is always scary. And for me, it was a turning point, one of many turning points in my life that led me to where I am today, but also helped me become a stronger person and just understand more of my family and his roots and where he came from. So it was a great, great experience. So you have a relationship with him today, which is, which is a good thing. And so you, you are fortunate that you have now gotten to know both of your parents. You went to High Point, um, and what did you major in there? I majored in English writing, and I minored in business marketing. Hmm. And when you graduated, what did you do with all that? Well, and side note, everyone should know that High Point is the furniture capital of the world. There's other furniture capitals, I think, in, in China and Las Vegas, but High Point is still considered the furniture capital of the world. So that's a pretty interesting, interesting fact. Today, I, after... I graduated, I decided I wanted to move into something to do with my major. Many of us who graduate from college just lead ourselves astray from what we were going to school for, which is pretty common and not a problem at all. But at the time, I really wanted to do something tangibly connected to English. So I looked at working for a publishing house. I also read a book at the time. I was really into books around oil and gas, fossil fuels, how they make the world turn and work. In addition to the comparison with climate change. And I wanted to work for this gentleman that my father knew at the time who was an executive at an oil company Neither of those 
opportunities panned out, my third backup plan, my third option was, why don't I think about living abroad, traveling abroad? I'm not quite sure what prompted me other than it was still the Great Recession. So the Great Recession of 07, 08, which was catastrophic to many people. And even if it wasn't catastrophic, everyone felt that time in some way. So I knew I didn't want to challenge myself or struggle finding a job, but I also reminisce peripherally from people who in college traveled abroad for study abroad, took gap years after high school. And I kind of wish that I had that opportunity. So it was a mishmash between desiring to live abroad, having that job security, but also just challenging myself. And so what did you decide to do with that? So you thought about doing something abroad and what did you do? And I made the decision shortly, I think shortly before graduation to move to Korea. But the decision that I had to make before I even made that decision was if I do move to Korea, then I have to choose between teaching English, being a professional, being in the army or military. I was not going into the military. That was just not something I wanted to do at that time. And I was not a professional who was proficient in the Korean language. So teaching English as a guest, as a native guest English speaker, teacher was truly my, my core option. And the two choices as a guest English teacher were teaching in a private school or public school. Teaching in a private school, namely, is very different in Korea. They're called hagwons, private schools in Korea, where oftentimes you're paid more than what you are in a public school, but benefits are sometimes non-existent, sometimes less, or just not as not as broad and much, much longer hours. So, Why is that? Why is that? You know, I really don't know. I know that the education system there is considered to be one of the top in the world. And I would say, in my opinion, just me having lived there, that a lot of parents and grandparents want their kids to do the best in school. So these hawkwads are considered with the long hours of the teaching and the long hours for the students, ways for them to accelerate getting their kids into the top schools top universities in the country. So you had a choice of, or at least the potential option of teaching in a private setting or in a more public setting, which did you end up doing? I went with public only because I wanted to make sure that I had enough benefits as far as health care. The pay was very good. Not as good as a hogwan, a private school, but I really wanted to make sure I had those benefits, that I had that structure. And the benefits offered from a from a public school, I mean, free room and board, it, it doesn't get better than that. Uh, free lunch, you know. So I really just loved the idea of not having to pay for an apartment, getting free lunch. And so I went with public. So where in South Korea did you teach? So Korea, in South Korea, I taught in what's called, what's referred to there as the Inland Island. I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, but the, the name of the, the uh, city was Yongyang and the province or the state that Yongyang was in was called Yongseng Bukdo, which was the the eastern part of the country. So 
So Seoul sits the capital on the western side. I was on the eastern side. Yeah, my visit to Korea was to Seoul and to places within an hour of it. I went to speak there in 2007 right. and, and had an opportunity to be there and and also see the uh, Korean guide dog schools, which were uh, or school, which was started by the president and others of Samsung. And so that was, uh, it was fascinating. I never got to meet him, but we did get to visit the school and do some speaking around Seoul. So that was fun, but I never did get to tour the whole country, um, which I would have loved to have done. It was a wonderful country and the people were, were extremely friendly to me at least and, and to my dog. Yes, it's, it's a country that is just, like you said, just gorgeous. The country of morning lands of morning calm. It's also a country of opposites in many ways. So really, really hot summer, sweltering hot, really, really cold winter, Siberian winds. And, you know, even, even some social norms and things like that. So, so what was it like for you teaching over there? That was a major step out for you to go to a different culture, a different place entirely, completely away from your comfort zone or what had been your comfort zone and all that you knew, but yeah, you did it. Yeah, honestly, living there, there were definitely some challenges. I, I would say moving there and all the pieces of the puzzle that you have to put together before you even get on the plane, that's a part of, that's a part of it too. So thinking about what am I going to do as far as money, I need to open a bank account in a country that I don't speak the language, learning a language, sure, but you really need to think about that, registering with the state department, getting immunizations. And so finally you get on that plane. And for me, I look back, said goodbye to my mom. She wasn't there. And it really hit me like, wow, you know, you are on your own. And when I sat down on the plane, it was just pure excitement. It was like total change of emotions. But when I got there and I experienced just the kindness of the people, you know, a neighbor who became a friend, he was working at the Korean military base in this rural town, which the town was a, a rural farming community that farmed their major product was uh, spicy peppers. He was living near me and helped me move from my second, my first school to my second school several hours away. He took me to dinners when I wasn't feeling well. And so, you know, those kinds of moments and those people, the way they care and even just routinely help when you're lost in the city of Seoul. Oh, let me, let me help you. Let me help you find what you're looking for. You look lost. It's just so opposite from the way <laughs> We interact in America and, you know, that collective family oriented culture, never eating alone. It really did leave a very good impression on me and made me cherish moments when, you know, maybe I was feeling most vulnerable, not knowing the language, not having a large support network of expatriates or foreigners in a small town, that was certainly a, an anchor for me. Mm -hmm. But you did it. Did you learn much of the language in the time you were there? Yeah. So I would say now I, I, I know literally choke them, <laughs> which means a little there. I would go to the grocery store. I would know how, what cash means, what, you know, just different survival terms mm -hmm. to get around. And so those those terms I knew. I knew 
instinctively and instantly teach her song saying them because titles in Korea mean a great deal more than they do in America. And roles and jobs like teachers probably mean as much as doctors mean here. So you'll have students running around, strangers saying, oh, song saying them. It's a form of respect to them. So I would say, you know, now I've probably lost most of that. I've not kept it up. But even what I did n t know, because Korean is a tonal language, oftentimes I wasn't even pronouncing it in the right tone. So there were constant miscommunications. Oftentimes, yes means no. So they will agree because that's a country, a collective society of service. What can we do for you? You know, what is the service? How can we help? But at the same time, it was still very, you know, constant miscommunications based on where I was living in the language. Well, why ultimately did you decide to move to Korea to teach? What motivated you really to do that? I mean, so you decided to do it, but as you reflect back on it, what, what caused you to decide to do that? That's a big step, most people would say. It is. It is a big step. I honestly think now, looking back, I wanted to experience the world. I also wanted to prove to myself, yeah, I can step outside of having my mom really support me, having my dad stepping out of the shadows and saying to myself, for my own self-worth, I appreciate me. And to just experience something that no one else had experienced that I know up until that point, no one I knew had lived in Asia, uh, let alone South Korea. So it was looking back, I think a test to myself. It was a self-imposed test. <laughs> self-imposed test. So... You mentioned that you moved from one school to another several hours away. Why, why did you move from one school to another? What kind of prompted that? So I, well, the move was for contract. So in Korea, you really learn about flexibility, adaptability as a best English teacher. You learn at a moment's notice, there's going to be a war drill or there's going to be you know, a holiday tomorrow, or your contract is still going to end on the same date, but we'd like to extend it or we'd like to shorten it. What do you think about that? It's just a lot of impromptu questions all the time. One, because of the language barrier. Two, because free and school systems or the guest English teachers operate on a need-to-know basis. So... You need to know, they will tell you, which usually is uh, pretty, pretty quick, pretty last minute. I decided with that in mind to renew my contract. I just felt like the story was not done for me there. And I needed to move to a place that was a little bit more cosmopolitan. I was hoping a bigger city, and that's what I ended up moving to. The English program in Korea was actually the program that I was hired through. And I was hired before that through the Council on International Education Exchange called CIEE. That is basically a recruiter for the English program in Korea, which is a government program in Korea that hires guest English teachers. And so I knew someone about an hour away. He was the regional coordinator for the English program in Korea. He had sent an email to all the teachers in Gongsang Bakto that we have a role. It's in Yechon. It's the boys' high school. If you'd like to take up this role, let me know. And so it wasn't far from me 
but it was closer to Seoul, which was great. And I just wanted to just to stay and experience a bigger city, be closer to Seoul, and continue my learning of the culture. So you took it, and there you were. How much larger was the second town or the more cosmopolitan area for you? I don't know how much larger. It was definitely by population, but it was definitely quite large in that there was, uh, there was a skyline. And I will also say that that city, Yechon, was close to the mass dancing city. So Korean mass dancing is a tradition in, in their culture. And that city is called Andong. So Yechon and Andong were probably about 20, 30 minutes apart. Andong was an even bigger city. So it was still, Yechon was still a farming community, but it had enough of an infrastructure socially for me to make the decision with about seven other expatriates and a few more shops for me to for me to enjoy, I would say Yechon was about two and a half to three hours from Seoul. Young Yang was five. So it was a great move in that way that I could still, you know, I could still make that jump in, in a quicker way. So when I was there, I never really got to, as I say, do a lot of touring around it's um to be to be real cute so did you ever find a costco in south korea that is so funny that you asked <laughs> that i don't recall that but you know there's a very similar chain called home plus i believe that's the name of uh, the right the chain and it's basically like a costco you've got a lot of a lot of goods in bulk and so many weekends from Yechon, I would take the bus to Andong, where the Home Plus was, and just buy tons and tons of food and things like that. There was one instance where before I was in Yechon, I actually took the bus, which all the names of the buses, all the routes, all the time, everything's in Korean. So I took the bus. It was my first winter in Korea. I had some coats, but nothing that I needed for sub-zero temperatures Fahrenheit. <laughs> so I took the bus, I thought, to Andong from Yongyang, which was about two hours or so. What I didn't know was I actually took the bus to Daegu which was a while longer. And so when I got off the bus and I was realized I was not in Andong, <laughs> I was like, well, where's the home plus? Might as well make the best of it. So I just, you know, went shopping, uh, get some coats and hats and things like that. Thermal so underwear. You found a home plus. I found a home plus. You've got to be able to adapt. You're going to miss steps living abroad, living in a foreign country. So those kinds of lessons where you can be flexible is, is really, really important. What would you advise to someone if, um, if they're thinking of going to a foreign country or living in a foreign country or even just going as part of a holiday or whatever? What would you advise people? What I would advise, well, living in a foreign country, I would say there are pivotal moments while you're there, but then there's a pivotal moment of making that decision to even go there and, and live there. And I would say for me, when I made the decision to get on that plane, it wasn't necessarily a no return, but it was a change. And for me, it's a, it's a point at which the experience didn't just change my life, 
it started a new one. And so with that comes challenges with all kinds of, you know, items and, and things in, in, in those challenges, such as language barriers, cultural confusion, cultural incompetency, which my job today is developing and helping to empower and make people knowledgeable of cultural competency. But there's a lot of different roads that you have to pass once you make that decision living abroad. Living abroad as well, however long you live abroad, you have to remember and know, which I would say was not something that I was made aware of emphatically is that you will have to adjust. You will have reverse culture shock. Now I would say certain countries, you probably have more than others. For me being in a Western culture, being raised, moving to an Eastern East Asia, Eastern country, the culture shock was quite great, especially thinking about when you don't have access to or aren't listening to just think about music all of the current music that you listen to that oftentimes unless you're on youtube or your or your latest app you may miss out on that you also may miss out on trends and sometimes news and just feel like you're out of place when you come back so that's really important i would say just going abroad period register with the state department in case of an emergency and just be open-minded know that you have a bias no matter where you're from what your background is when i first got out of the airport in seoul or incheon and i looked around at the cars i just the first thing i noticed was every car is black white or gray I was like, whoa, <laughs> that was the second point when I realized the gravity of my decision because it is a collectivist country. Everyone is thinking about each other. There's not a lot of variations in colors and, and things like that. Such a small, such a small visually uh, interesting fact, but also longstanding in terms of the ramifications of that decision. Do you regret having spent two years over there or were you, do you feel that it was a valuable experience? What's your reaction thinking back on it now? Yeah, I absolutely think it was a valuable experience. I do not regret it one bit. If I could do it over again, I would I'd probably do some things differently, but every conversation I have meeting someone new, it usually comes up when I'm interviewing for jobs, like the job I'm in now. It's always a point of pride and a point of experience, something that no one can ever take away from you. And I, I love that. So I, I, I know the way I was challenged in many ways. I had some of the best times in my life meeting different people from around the world in Seoul coming out, which was not necessarily the best time living there so far from home, but coming out as a gay black man over Skype to my family on my mom's side, who was, who was very, very welcoming and, you know, very proud of me for doing so. And my dad was too later on, yeah. but. I was thinking that by that time, we had a lot more ability to communicate. So at least you had some opportunities to talk to people back here in the States that you wouldn't have had 10 or 15 years before. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I actually, I would, because I went through a recruiter, the CIEE organization, which I think is now an NGO, they offered me the opportunity to blog about my experiences there. So I was joined by a number of bloggers, guest English teachers, where I posted about this and that. 
And I was able to your point to email that blog to family and friends. They could keep up with me. There was one particular time, the summer of no, the spring of 2013, where I was getting a lot of emails because of the North Korean missile crisis. Mm. Today, it's looked at as a pivotal point in time or a, a point in time where really they had ramped up from February to May so many different threats to South Korea and to America, which they still do today. They're very frustrated usually with our annual military drills in the spring. That year, it was so bad that they actually scrapped 1953 armistice. They told foreigners, you should probably leave because there's going to be a war. It's going to be violent. It was crazy. It got so bad that my mom and I started talking about escape plans. If war does break out, a violent war, how are you going to get home? So, yeah, I would say definitely, you know, there were there were those times when I was especially grateful for the modern communication. So you were over in South Korea for two years and then you decided that that was enough or what, what was your motivation for then deciding to come back? My motivation deciding to come back was, yeah, I, I thought that was enough. I had made what I thought, which is definitely the case in my eyes, lifelong friends I had pushed myself to the limit, even from the climate, cultural norms, food perspective, housing perspective. And I wanted to start my professional career back home. Ultimately, I didn't want to, I didn't want to push that back any longer. Some people I still know, they're teaching all over the world, backpacking, staying in Korea. And that works for them. But for me, after two years, I was grateful for the experience. So many great times, challenging times, but I was ready to um, to come back. So, so you you came back, and what were you thinking about doing with your life once you came back? So I came back, I honestly didn't know. I wanted to process what I had just done. And I also went through, I think, three months of reverse culture talk. What I envisioned as the American culture that I left, what I envisioned as the culture of my community, the LGBTQ plus community, the culture of Atlanta, all of those things as an expatriate living thousands of miles away in some way or another were not what I envisioned them to be, which is just not good or bad. It's just what happens. So I had the privilege living over there, having free room and board to save a lot of money. So I didn't need to work the first three or so months that I was back and then I was lucky enough in the spring. So I got back in August and I got a job in March the following year through a British insurance company called his insurance. And I'm grateful to this day that they hired me Had a great, great career there for five years. But that's really what, I did was just reflect. I had definitely some, I don't want to say challenges, but it, it really was a challenge in many ways because my, my concern at that point was my health. I had come back after spraining my ankle earlier in the year, back when I was in Korea and when I was in Korea and I went to a doctor the first time, due to language barriers, there was 
no need for me to wrap my ankle that I had wrapped. Um, although it was a sprained ankle, so of course I needed to wrap it. Then when I went to get, I think it was an MRI or an X-ray, they actually told me that your foot has an extra bone. And so you probably just surgery to get the bone out. So by the time I got home, you know, again, just reminiscing the good times, the challenging times, and then also thinking at some point, I'm going to have to probably get this out. So again, I was grateful to get the job several months past, but I think anyone coming back from living abroad should really, if they can take that time to just adjust. So it did you have an rough. extra phone in your foot? Did you have an extra bone in your foot? If I could talk, I'd be in great shape. I sure did. I sure did. I had an accessory bone down there. Yeah. And in, in the foot uh, on, on the side of my ankle. And so I ended up having surgery so later that yeah. year after I was hired it was a reconstructive surgery, the first of its kind that my doctor had done. They reattached the tendon, took the bone out, and gave me an arch. So I likely will have to have the same thing done to my other foot, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So at least they diagnosed it over there. And um, exactly, that, that was an interesting experience, I bet, and you didn't expect Totally unexpected, but that's what comes with doing things that are unconventional. And when you take risk, you know, was, you know, you can't foresee everything that happens. It's a calculated risk. I also had, you know, um, a finger, a, a little cyst in my finger that I had to get taken out um, right before I came home. It, you know, there's just things like that. Coming from a Western country, any country, when you live somewhere else, do the climate, food, you learn things more about your body and your health that you weren't aware of. And you have to be prepared that if there's a language barrier or any other barrier, you may not have the same access to what it is that you need to repair or recover from any issues with your health. You decided not to do the surgery in Korea, obviously, and you came back here to do that. Yeah, and Korean has Korea has very good, you know, hospitals, let's be clear, especially in Seoul. I just wanted to be home with mm -hmm. family, knowing I was coming home that that following year. So it really just actually I think that was the same year I came home. So what was the job the insurance company gave you? I was an underwriting assistant, which before I really read the description, thought it was related to writing. So I'm like, oh, I'm back in, I'm back doing something connected to my major. And um, it was actually a really interesting job, processing job, but processing along the lines of commercial insurance. So cybersecurity, technology errors and emissions, really interesting job, interesting people, learns a lot. Definitely put in my time. I worked till midnight one time. I was, I was a workhorse at that point. And I, I work hard now and I, you know, work smart, collaborate, all of those things. But I, I really try to just be in the present and, and balance and integrate my work and life in a way where I'm not going to burn myself out. Um, as you, as a lot of early and earlier in career people tend to disregard coming out, just want to prove ourselves and, and things like that. Let me just work till my wits ends, but um, no, it, I, I don't do that anymore, but it was a great company. Still have great friends from there. One of my mentors from the Pride Resource Group will keep in touch. So when you, as an underwriter, you're, you're doing that work, what is it you do? Um, so you were talking about everything from D 
dealing with intellectual property and cybersecurity and so on. What do you do? Or what did you yeah, do? So as in, I was really the underwriting assistant for the underwriter. So they would look up the risk of, you know, what's the risk of, you know, Michael, Michael Hingson's company having a data breach. Okay, so this is what we'll cover. If you have a data breach, this is the amount that we'll pay. And so as an underwriting assistant, I would then help kind of put those rates together for them, but more often than not, provide them with a quote to send to you or rather your broker, your insurance broker, and, you know, just kind of processing, getting those quotes out, getting those declines out and canceling policies when, when necessary. That was my day, day out. Well, and it it clearly can be a part of a fascinating process. And I recognize the the value and the the need of insurance and the whole concept of risk management. And um, I speak about risk management from another side, which is basically more on the emergency preparedness side. Um, you're in a room. You're listening to me speak. Do you know where the emergency exits are? Not the door that you came in, but the emergency exits. And uh, the whole concept of risk management from that standpoint, which also um, very possibly could affect your insurance, how well do you make sure that people who come to your facility know what to do in an emergency and how well do you teach people might very well affect what you have to pay in the way of insurance so that you prove that you're being as careful as you can be. You know what, Michael, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, the importance cannot be understated. And even terrorism, kidnap ransom, mm-hmm. my computer, all of, all of those, all of those. But I do remember from reading your book and just looking at YouTube videos and, and research that you had all of the plans from as a survivor of, of 9-11 working in the tower, one of the towers, you had those plans in Braille that you had basically were an expert as to how to evacuate before the catastrophe that happens occurred. Is I still correct? remember I still remember speaking at one organization meeting uh, risk managers in Missouri, I think we were at Branson, but it was a meeting of risk management people from the Midwest. And after speaking, one of the people said, you know, we've never thought about the fact that as as a company, and it was a power company, they were one of the utilities, we have generation generating stations and we don't teach our people really how to get out. That is, if there's a fire down in the station... How are people going to be able to get out because they can't see due to the smoke and so on? And we actually worked together to develop a mechanism by which their people were able to escape without being able to see the exits because of the smoke. So they took that sort of thing very seriously. And it is. And people really need to prepare more than they do. But they put some things in place. It was really cool to, to hear about it later, which is just really wonderful. So you worked at the insurance company for five years, and uh, that's a that's a good long time for uh, for some people. But you worked there for five years. So what uh, what made you leave, and where did you go? Honestly, I really just wanted to lean in more to that interest that I had found and, and passion related to diversity, inclusion, belonging, and really being able to sink my teeth into a full-time diversity, inclusion, and belonging role. I was working in my last job as a training coordinator there. So I had some exposure to training courses focused on women in leadership and in unconscious bias, but I wanted to do more. I had started what we called at the time our LGBT plus work 
with who someone I now call a friend, an executive there, but also several other employees who are based in London. And so we created this global, what I call now at my current company, Employee Resource Group, ERG, and it was very successful. I mean, senior leadership was totally engaged. The The visibility was global. It was on the top of everyone's minds. And honestly, biased, but I think that it gave other networks the visibility that they needed as well. And it put a spotlight on all the efforts that were going on related to inclusion and diversity. So much what? so that they asked me to speak to the company about the networks. What led you to develop the passion? Or did you just start to think about it and it kind of grew or what? I still to this day, I'm not quite sure. You know, it's funny because my dad consulted for many years with Christ on crisis management, public relations, and inclusion and diversity. And I never thought that I would be doing the same thing as him, but in many ways, I am following in his footsteps, which was totally unintended. I think that when I was raising my hand during focus groups for employee networks, for initiatives related to inclusion and diversity, I just was curious and wanted to help in any way. It it just kind of found me. So you left the company, the insurance company, and did you and your friends start your own company or did you go to work for someone else or what? I, so I got a job about a month later, I was hired by Intercontinental Hotels. This was actually the year of 2020 and it was in March. So shortly before I started, that job, which was a full-time diversity and inclusion role, specialist role, I had enrolled in a Cornell online course, Certificate in Diversity and Inclusion. So that was a self, self-taught self course. Like we had instructors, but everything was um, on your own time, rather. So there was no rush for me, but I had it in the event it took longer to find the job than I expected. Well, even though I found the job and I got a job rather quickly, COVID hit, of course. And so just starting there, I was let go. It was a contract to permanent position. And at the time, there were a number of other people who were permanent, I believe, who who might have been let go as well. But so many companies were just scrambling as to what to do. Everyone was sent home. And so I just used that time in between jobs to complete that course, which was a very rigorous course about engagement, your own engagement. When you weren't engaged, what did you do? Why do you feel that that was the case? And how do you make others feel engaged and included? So that took me about eight months to complete by the end of it. I moved on to another company that had extended an offer. That company was a great, great role, great, great company. But after about two years with that company, I decided, you know what? I would like a change. And I feel like there's a new environment, a new path where I can experience being a diversity and inclusion manager. I had left after IHG and starting at this company eight months later or in the fall, I was a consultant for diversity and inclusion, helping people, partnering with an accessibility, uh, subject matter expert, others from different parts of the world. And it was a great, great experience for me. But Every company is on their own maturity skill as far as diversity, inclusion, equity, all of these things. 
I wanted to experience a company that was on a different part of the scale. And so I, that's what landed me to where I am now. So where are you now? Now I am at Lumen Technologies. I'm one of our global diversity and inclusion inclusion and belonging managers. We actually are a telecommunications company transforming as a technology company traded on the New York Stock Exchange and just a great, great company. Curious, being present, a lot of great values and just putting our money where our mouth is and our commitment as well. So I am just elated to be able to do what I do in this capacity, moving a mile a minute, but also seeing the change and being the change you want to see. That is what Lumen is. And I'm so happy to be along for the ride. So what is it you do? So as global as a global inclusion, belonging, and diversity manager at Lumen, I manage our are starting to manage our communication and our partnership with the international organizations at Lumen. So we have our APAC, India, EMEA. All of those organizations have what we call employee resource groups. And so the thread of that, or the holder of the thread of all of our employee resource groups comes back to me. So I help to oversee our disability and abilities ERG. We have 11 employee resource groups, help to see our black professionals ERG. We have a number of ERGs that really help create more engagement, more of a safe space, but also just to help anyone feel included. And so that's a part of my role, but there's so many others and I really just love it. How much influence do you have in getting the company when you discover something that maybe isn't right from an inclusion standpoint with one group or another? How much influence do you have in being able to change mindsets and change policy? So actually, it's it's funny that you say that. My boss is the chief diversity officer. So she brought all of us in to be curious, have new ideas, different diverse perspectives. And so with that, everything that I think about ideas, I'm not necessarily implementing all of them, but many of the ideas I have or perspectives or feedback related to, I'm just going to say policy, Mm -hmm. that does go back up to the C-suite just because my boss is the chief diversity officer. So I often am leading task force related to changes in policies, how to get more employees engaged at all levels of the organization. And it all is exposed to senior leadership one way or another. So I would say it's uh, pretty close, (laughs) pretty close. Well, let me, let me um, rephrase the question slightly. So uh, maybe I should say how much does the chief diversity officer and and the department have in the way of influence? But let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, someone, and I will use disabilities here. Let's say a blind person comes along and says, I'm interested in being a part of your company or They get hired and they say, I need screen reader software to be able to um, to, um, read what's on my computer screen because I can't read it otherwise. Or I go to these meetings and people are always handing out documentation at the beginning of the meetings and then people read it and they discuss it. But nobody provides that in a form that I can use, much less provided in advance so that I really have access to it and can become familiar with it before the meeting, which really is the way we ought to handle documentation in general. But um, so someone comes to you and says, I got this problem. What? um, And and I've gone to my boss, um, I tell you, and my boss has said, well, that's just the way it is. We're not going to do anything about it. That's clearly discriminatory 
um, and non-inclusive. How do you deal with that? Absolutely. So I would say my boss would definitely be involved. So if that employee came and emailed me or my boss, it would definitely get raised to the leadership level, depending on what the what the request is. In that scenario, I would say that's absolutely discriminatory. And we do accommodate. Um, we are inclusive of everyone, regardless of nationality, disability, ability, race, ethnicity, religion, all of those, all of those dimensions. And so it would be addressed, it would be listened to, and we'd make the accommodation or change needed. Do we, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting conundrum because it all comes down to what people consider priorities and the cost of doing business. So, for example, something that a number of us face regularly is we go into meetings, documentations handed out, papers, and they're referred to constantly during the meeting, but nobody makes them available for me to be able to access them. The other part about it is, which really is, I think, the more interesting aspect of it is that all too often we hand out documentation at meetings for people to read and the excuse is, well, we got to wait till the last minute to get the most current data. And the answer is, do you really? Rather than saying, we're going to provide the documentation in advance so you should come prepared to discuss it. So at the meeting, you really discuss, not spend half your meeting or a good portion of your meeting mm -hmm. just preparing by reading it. And if you then do it in advance, it's a lot easier to make the documentation or the information accessible in a form that's usable. But getting people to change that mindset is really hard. But really, it ought to be part of the cost of doing business to make sure that true inclusion takes place. And it is so often a difficult thing to get people to change their mindset to do that, which is what prompted the question. You're right. Yeah, the the mindset change is is difficult. I think at any company, specifically around this this topic in a time of transformation, a time in society where the economy is very uncertain, <laughs> the the times that we're living in, and if you don't have those infrastructure those systems in place already to support the mindset shift that makes it even more difficult i think the way lumen has been committed to inclusion for many many years has helped where we are moving forward in our journey we also have a new ceo who is from microsoft it's been all over the news and, and, and LinkedIn, and she's just wonderful. So she's also very committed to inclusion and, and diversity. And I think we're on a great, a great trajectory, a great path, but it's, it's not easy for anyone to change those minds. Yeah. But you do have to meet people where they are. So, you, you know, you, you absolutely do. And it is a process. It's a learning process. It's a growing process on all sides. Well, right. I will I will tell you, this has been absolutely fun. And we've been doing this for about an hour now. Can you believe it? And so I think what we'll do is we will go ahead and stop. But I want to get you back on in the future because I'd love to hear how your your journey and your adventure goes and hear more about the experiences that you have at Lumen and whatever you do because your whole adventure now dealing with inclusion and diversity and so on is a worthwhile one to continue to discuss. Thank you so much, Michael. This has been fun for me as well. I've really never told this story at length, except other than to family and, and friends. So it's been nice getting some of these, these points out and, also, going down memory lane, I uh, appreciate you taking me down that, too. Well, um, thank you for, for doing it and being willing to, to go down memory lane. And I want to thank you for listening, and I hope that you enjoyed this. 
Evan has done a, a great job of giving us a lot of insights and a lot of useful information. I hope that you found it interesting and that you enjoyed the, the podcast episode today. Please give us a five-star rating wherever you are and wherever you're listening to this with whatever system, we would appreciate it. Um, if you'd like to reach out, Evan, if people want to reach out to you, is there a way they can do that? Yeah, people can just reach out to me on LinkedIn. So Evan Robert Brown Walker, my name, just type that in on LinkedIn. You're welcome to connect with me, send me a message. Also, if you have questions about actually going abroad and living abroad, there are a number of resources. Mike, I'm going to share those with you. Uh, Please. You know, we can we can share as far as links like the Council on International Education Exchange and their website called Transition Transitions Abroad for research. The blog articles that you wrote when you were in Korea, are they available to the public anywhere? That would be a fun series of links or link to those blogs to read. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's funny. I was looking, I want to say two or three years ago, and they totally redid their site. I will, oh, wow. I will check with one of their directors, but those blogs I think have since, since gone. Yeah. Gone to the big recycle bin in the sky. The huh? big recycle bin. <laughs> yeah, they've been replaced. There's now new bloggers. Well, um, that's fair too. Mm -hmm. Well, again, we appreciate it. And for all of you, reach out to Eben. He would love to hear from you, obviously. And I would like to hear your comments as well. So feel free to email me at michaelhi at accessibe, a -C -C -E -S -S -I -B -E com, or visit our podcast page, www michael hingson h-i-n-g-s-o-n dot com slash podcast we'd love to hear from you and of course those ratings are greatly appreciated love to get your thoughts and if you have people in mind or think of people who you think we ought to have an unstoppable mindset and evan you as well uh, whether it's other people at lumen or elsewhere we'd love to hear from you and always are looking for podcast guests who can come on and tell stories so We'd appreciate you letting us know about those people as well and giving us introductions. Absolutely. Well, thank you one last time for being here. We really appreciate you doing this. And I expect to have you back on and we can hear about more adventures. Oh, thank you, Michael. Pleasure meeting you as well. And thank you again for the opportunity. Look forward to next time.